This is dated February 18, 2005. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, before you went to jail, what were you thinking about? What were some of your emotions when you went to court or when they first put cuffs on you? No lie, there was plenty of times I could have gotten taken to the precinct or gotten arrested just because of the friends I hanged out with. A lot of people, parents, teachers, even kids told me to stay away from these friends, but it's just hard because the activity they do just encourage you to do the same anyway. Nice writing to you. Hope you stay a peaceful gentleman. Hope you write back again. Keep your head up. So this is um, BCM, BCM Park is what we used to call it growing up. It's now called Brower Park, that's a proper name, but growing up we used to call it BCM. We used to play ball here, do a lot of other stuff here. This is where I taught my nephew how to play ball. This is where I learned how to play ball, literally on this court. It's interesting. So the 80s and 90s in Crown Heights is like a lot of ghettos in the city, in the country. There's a lot more murders and you know, crack was king. My older brother and sister would definitely tell you that I was a nerdy, geeky kid. You know, the nerdy persona and all that stuff didn't work for me. So eventually, because of some other things that happened when I was like a little bit older, around 14, um, I just sort of, like, sort of made a conscious decision to like shift. One was like I was jumped badly, like really beaten. Somebody tried to rob me in school um, in Western House downtown and got really bad. I was out of school for a little bit. And then like even in recovery of it, um, I was almost raped at gunpoint by a random per by a person in Manhattan, literally. And I had, you know, I'm telling you about this now, and this is not something I was comfortable telling people. Not until maybe three, four years ago is when I first felt comfortable even telling people about that. Those two things like stuck with me a lot, and it bothered me a lot, and it, it walked with me as I walked every day. And I was like, literally, like this ain't gonna happen to me anymore. So things shifted, didn't happen overnight, but like a lot of activities that I knew not to engage in things I knew that would probably be problematic and troublesome, people to be around. I started like slowly like getting in there and becoming that and, and involving myself with it. We're gonna hold the door. This elevator is where I was shot. There's three of us in here and a homeboy of mine's had a gun and he pulled it out and he was just like trying to like, you know, he was trying, he was just messing with it. And I guess it went off and I was standing right here and the gun went off and it went off and I, you know, I felt the pain in my foot, but I didn't know. But I know my homeboy's behind me. I sort of like fell back a little bit. And then I didn't see anything. I didn't see no blood or nothing, but I knew I felt like it was burning. Like somebody had like a blighter that was on my foot. And I knew it and I realized there was a hole in my bottom of my sneaker. So the bullet actually hit out, hit the bottom of the ground and popped back out. The doctor said I never walked the same again. Proves him wrong, but I still, still, I still got like nerve pain in it. That was happening actually a year and a half before I was locked up. A friend of mine told me about a robbery. That, you know, folks was planning a robbery of a store in Manhattan. Literally, I was just outside on the block, and they talking about it, and they was like they about to go case the joint, and I was like, all right, well, let me come along. Let me just walk. And, and part of me didn't even believe that it was really going to do that, but I was like, I ain't got nothing to do right now. Let me just take the ride to Manhattan. And somebody went and cased the store. I didn't even go to the store. I stayed in the train station. The next thing I know, you know, they're planning a robbery. And I'm a part of it. On that day, that Wednesday afternoon, I was in school at the time, Apex Technical School. And I literally took the day off from school. Uh, I said, I'm going to just go along with this. We drive up into Manhattan. And I we got out of the car. And I get outside the car with uh, two other folks who were the people that was going to go inside the store. And I stand across the street from the store. It's no more than about three to five seconds later, shots rung out. And a lot of shots ring out. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening. So I literally just get out the store and I see where everybody walking. I just walk where everybody else is walking to you know, get away. Cause I don't really don't know what's happening. I don't even know who's shooting at who. And as I remember looking around, I see somebody shooting at the guy that I was with. So I'm now even more confused. I'm like, what, like, I don't know what's happening. I get home, I turn on the news. I'll never forget it was, uh, around the Subway Series time, the Mets and the Yankees 
And a special report comes on Channel 4, and I remember Chuck Scarborough coming on the news and talking about two people were killed at a uh, bagel shop in Manhattan, and two other people were injured. And I see two, other, two of the guys I was with on the news arrested. I didn't think police was after me for anything. I went to school the next few days and thinking, minding my business, and really concerned about the people that were killed, but also, and also concerned about the, my friend that got locked up. Like, dag, like, you facing murder now? Like, like what to do? You know, Saturday morning, early Saturday morning, I'm coming, I come in my uh, elevator on the sixth floor, and as soon as I open the door, I'm a big, burly, white uh, detective blowing smoke, cigarette smoke, and blew it in my face, and asked me, you Marlon Peterson? I was like, yeah, and he threw me against the wall. And my family were all right there, and there's cops all over here. And the cops saw me in my hand. I had some VHS, VHS tapes in my hand. He, he asked me what it was. I saw him what it was. He dropped it and just threw me against this wall here. And this is where I was locked up. And then they took me out. They took me out. I mean, all I remember saying, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Obviously, I didn't go home. Um, and that was the last time I saw the streets until I was 30 in 2009. I remember a kid telling me in a program I had started a couple years ago saying like guns are like sneakers, right? So like people having guns is like no big deal, right? It was just like people got a gun, like so like people got butter knobs in their house. So when the idea for a robbery came up, yeah, robbery is serious, but I definitely think anybody I was with was capable. I mean, my logic at that time was that I don't think anybody was capable, who I was that tight with was capable of killing somebody. It sounded like when we used to come outside, you hang out, and they like, yo, we going to the store. You want to walk me to the store? We going to, we going to buy a pair of sneakers downtown. All right, let's go. And it was sort of like we going to Casey joint. All right, let's go. Like, you know, we just hanging outside. It was nothing to do, and I just went along with it. It was, you know, it was obviously stupid, no question about it. And, and that stupidity tremendously affected and shifted people's lives. Um, I mean, ended people's lives.